Okay, there we go. So um, the title of this session is Three Perspectives on Creativity and Wellbeing. I suspect that uh, while there are three perspectives, you're going to see some real themes and synergy among the presentations. Uh, I will introduce our guest speakers on um, the order with which we are going to share the time as Dr. Molly Hollinger will present first. Uh, Molly is an assistant professor of creativity and change leadership at SUNY Buffalo State, Buffalo State University. Yay, Molly, thank you for joining our team. Welcome. Uh, Molly is into her second semester uh, working in our department. I think she said something recently about um, the best department chair ever that she's had the pleasure of working with, something like that. I don't know, I, I may not be re remembering that correctly. She received her PhD in educational psychology with an emphasis on giftedness, creativity, and talent development from the University of Connecticut and her master's degree in creative studies from the Center for Applied Imagination, Buffalo State University. Her research and teaching focus on the positive outcomes of creativity such as engagement, meaning, and positive emotions. Round of applause for Dr. Hollinger. We also have with us Dr. James Kaufman. Dr. James Kaufman is a professor of educational psychology at the University of Connecticut. Uh, we've also discovered earlier in our conversation that he is the love doctor at uh, University of Connecticut. Apparently through his lab, he has been able to uh, match uh, married couples up, uh, students who ended up going on to three couples who ended up being married. So if uh, you're looking for a PhD in educational psychology and a life partner, you want to go study with Dr. James Kaufman. On top of that, James has been an author and editor of 50 books. Let me say that again, 5050 books, including Creativity 101 and the Cambridge Handbook of Creativity with Robert Sternberg. He has published more than 300 papers, including the study that spawned the Sylvia Plath effect with Ron Baghetto, the 4C model of creativity. He is past president of Division 10 of the American Psychological Association, and he co-founded two major creativity journals. So welcome to both of you. Molly, you're going to present first, I believe, and then you'll hand it off to James, and then James to me. Molly, I give you the microphone and the camera. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, before I, I share my screen, um, I'll just say, uh, so I am uh, one of those uh, three couples. <laughs> so um, I owe to James. Uh, he introduced me to my fiance. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to be presenting with um, James today and um, Dr. Puccio, both of whom have had a, a huge influence not only on uh, how I think about creativity, um, but also my life as well. And um, and you'll see a, a lot of their influence uh, in my talk today. So with that, I will share my slides with you. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep. Thank you. All right, so um, as Dr. Puccio mentioned, uh, we are each going to take a little bit of a different perspective on creativity. Um, so I thought what I would do is um, set the stage a little bit in terms of what we've seen in the past in terms of, of creativity research and well being. Um, and Zorana did touch on this yesterday, so I'll try not to repeat what she was saying, um, but also um, for those who weren't there, um, sort of give a little bit of a, a broad overview. So the first thing I wanna talk about is who's interested in creativity and well-being research. And uh, I, I think this may have changed since this study, but there was a study done um, in 2016 um, by Marie Forgeard and uh, James. So um, this study asked who cares about imagination and creativity and innovation? You know, uh, <laughs> uh, we all do, um, but <laughs> what do creativity researchers care about? Uh, and looking at the different um, um, 
areas that were coming up in research and only about 7.5% of creativity research was looking at well being. And this was in comparison to things like social psychology research, education research, um, and business research. Um, and that becomes uh, even a little bit more dramatic when you think that this is research focused not only on positive mental health, but also negative mental health. So that positive psychology approach is even a fraction of that 7.5%. And the question becomes, why is this? And again, I, I think the the, um, the interest is shifting and there is more energy put towards this topic now. Um, but I would argue um, one reason is that it's complicated. So why is it complicated? It's complicated because outcomes vary depending on the type of measure that we're using, the domain that we're looking at, uh, causality, the level of creativity, um, as well as the type of disease. And it should be said that many of these <laughs> issues are not only in well being research, but also um, issues in creativity research in general. Um, and the exception here is the, the type of disease. So I want to briefly go into each of these. And um, as uh, Gerard read James's bio, he mentioned the Sylvia Plath effect. And I think this is a great illustration of. Um, the patterns within domains. So James, <laughs> feel free to jump in at any time. Um, so in this study, um, James looked at different, um, actually uh, different patterns within a specific domain. So um, that being creative writing and looked at fiction versus poetry and found that the highest rates of mental illness occurred within women poets. So we see different patterns across domains, but even different patterns emerging within domains as far as their relationship between creativity and mental health. And then we have causality. <laughs> and again, I think um, the Sylvia Plath example is uh, illustrative of this in terms of, okay, was it um, her decision to, uh, to write poetry that maybe brought up some negative emotions that led to negative mental health or vice versa, was it, um, proclivities toward negative mental health, like anxiety or, or negative emotions where she um, was driven towards creativity um, as a means to potentially process those emotions. So um, there's the question of um, what leads to what in terms of creativity and mental health. And then we have those levels of creativity. So um, at the genius level, uh, a lot of research has been historiometric research. And um, we know there's, there's some bias in that research, right? Um, but there is some evidence that supports that whole mad genius stereotype. Um, at the big C level. Granted, <laughs> there's questions about um, sort of the validity of this research, but the good news is at the little C level or more generally looking at averages, um, there's actually a positive correlation between creativity and um, positive mental health. So there was a, a meta-analysis that was done recently um, by uh, actually a, a former faculty member at uh, Buffalo State, Selchuk Ajar. Um, and he found that there was, um, a, albeit small, uh, positive uh, correlation between um, creativity and mental health. So that's good news, right? <laughs> And then lastly, looking at type of, the type of measure and going back to this meta-analysis again, um, the beauty of meta-analyses is that you can see um, these broad relationships, but I think the, the more artful meta-analyses look at um, uh, 
more specifics. So this meta-analysis in particular looked at um, the different type of measures and the effect sizes. And you can see here that measures of creative potential, like divergent thinking, were less indicative of well-being as compared to self-report measures um, and measures of creative activity and behavior. And this is something that I found in my dissertation research as well. So um, there isn't much research on the different stages of the creative process and their uh, relationship with well-being. So uh, I wanted to know, is there any relationship between problem identification specifically, idea generation specifically, and idea generation evaluation, excuse me, specifically, and well-being? and um, some different aspects of well-being. So we, we also asked about positive affect, negative affect, and long-term well-being. And <laughs> it turns out, at least from this study, um, there were no significant um, relationships between those performance measures um, and these well-being outcomes. However, we also gave um, the Kaufman domains of creativity scale and did find some significant correlations between um, everyday creativity and long-term well-being. So taking this all together, what, <laughs> why are we talking about this? What, uh, what does that tell us going forward? Um, and this is a quote, again, from that meta-analysis article um, saying that well-being is more likely to be achieved when someone takes concrete steps towards their goals um, and witnesses the outcomes of their own creativity. Um, so what I think we can draw from this meta-analysis and, and what I saw with my dissertation research is when it comes to well-being, it's more of a focus on mindset, actually, actually engaging in creative behaviors, um, right? Because you can't um, have those outcomes without actually doing the work, like such, a, such as um, engaging in flow activities, for example. That's gonna lead to more positive well-being versus um, those ability measures. Um, so, so the implication when it comes to actually measuring well-being is perhaps, and, and this is a question up for debate, um, but just what I've been seeing, um, is that perhaps creative behavior or self-report measures, um, experience sampling measures are more useful um, in, in terms of this area of research versus creative performance or creative potential um, measures. And, you know, ideally <laughs> we can do it all, but oftentimes our resources are uh, limited. So this brings me to the creativity and well-being scale, which um, James and I have been developing over a, a few years now. And our aim with this scale was to develop a measure that looked at both creativity and well-being, because there are several very robust measures looking at well-being, um, respectively, as well as creativity specifically. Um, I'm sure a lot of these are familiar to you all, um, but none to our knowledge that looked at both. So we hypothesized um, two factors for the scale. Um, the first being related to hedonia. And this is something that Zorana referenced yesterday uh, in her talk, but to refresh your memory or for those who weren't there, this relates to um, more short-term um, well-being such as pleasure, joy, ecstasy. And then the second factor is eudaimonia. And these are our deeper indicators of well being, such as meaning um, and living according to one's values. And so this was the um, long term factor. Uh, and just to give you a, an idea for what um, the items looked like, so a more granular view of the scale, um, a short-term example was when I am being creative, I feel completely absorbed in what I'm doing. Um, and you can probably guess that that um, item is getting at the, the concept of flow. And then the um, long-term example is that um, being creative can help me accomplish my goals. 
Um, so when we were validating the measure, we gave some other measures along with it, specifically the subjective happiness scale. Um, and we did find some correlations between um, the short-term and long-term factor. It was a little bit surprising to us that the correlation was a little bit higher with the, the long-term factor um, because um, the subjective happiness scale is theoretically measuring happiness um, as a short-term emotion, but we thought that perhaps people were conceiving of it as a, a longer-term state, and that might be um, what was informing these correlations. Um, and also the satisfaction with life scale, which did fall in line with our hypotheses um, that uh, it was not significantly correlated with the short-term factor, but it was correlated with the long-term factor. And then also uh, qu quite robust uh, correlations with um, creative self-efficacy, which uh, makes a lot of sense. So this uh, scale, as I mentioned, is under development. It's under review currently, but um, fingers crossed it will be um, available for you soon and it will be um, open source. Um, so, um, I invite uh, any of you to get in touch with me if you, you would like to uh, know more. And uh, thank you so much for listening. With that, I will pass it on to James. Yeah. All right, I am unmuted. Oh, good. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the creativity advantage. And before I start off, I mean, I'm always kind of faced with this question of do we even need to bother talking about why creativity is valuable? It, it feels like talking about why puppies are a good thing and why ice cream is nice and why The Godfather is a good movie. I mean, it's not like it's necessarily being strongly challenged. There isn't this big anti-creativity grassroots movement, um, at least not labeled as such. And I mean, on one hand, no, but people tend to prefer the status quo. Most new products fail. We like things that exist. And there's a number of studies showing that People say they like creativity, but then there are these implicit biases against creative people or the same people who are saying that they like creativity then show they don't actually understand what creativity means. And certainly, you know, even though the relationship of, as Molly had mentioned, between creativity and well being isn't quite as robust, there are certainly talking points. Creativity is associated with better grades. Um, there was a neat meta analysis on creativity and GPA a few years back. Creative adults tend to do better in the workplace, more likely to be good entrepreneurs. But then you got the fact that grades are actually twice as highly correlated with conscientiousness. And even the reason creativity is associated with grades and workplace performance could be more about creativity and cognitive ability than anything else. But there is more. And some of that is the well being stuff that Molly has talked about. I'm going to focus on a variety of other kind of sometimes much more nuanced and specific verging on esoteric benefits. And it's important to note, it doesn't matter what sea level we're talking about, that these benefits should help the creator regardless of where they are. So one is the power of the narrative. Narratives help us. A lot of this is James Pennebaker's work on the writing cure. There's a whole bunch of stuff whether it's blogging, writing stories, journaling, diarying, um, some types of narrative therapy do this, but it's also specifically the narrative. There have been studies, for example, on poetry, um, 
and it doesn't help. They had people write poems on a regular basis and they got better poetry, but they were no happier. And indeed, in addition to the broad well-being, everything from better memory to not ruminating, which can then lead to depression, better insight into trauma and grief, better identity, healing. And there is a ton of research on this, a lot of which I kind of dived into when I was working on forthcoming books, The Creativity Advantage, a lot of it not in creativity journals necessarily. And this is largely the arts, a lot of stuff on drawing, a lot of stuff on writing, but you find some stuff on things like gardening and cooking. A lot of this is improving mood, it can distract us. A lot of this growing after trauma, post-traumatic growth, a lot of the work from Marie Forgeyard, a lot of this work on distraction is Jen Drake, and similarly, reduces anxiety, helps people relax, takes away anger. There's also this concept of connection, and this is often in both in being creative, but also partaking in cultural and creative activities. So it could be actually singing, but it could also be listening to music or going to the theater. Um, and so the museum effect, for example, by Jeff Smith looks at how when you're at an art museum, you feel more interconnected with the world. A lot of this stuff on theater and crafts and participation in everyday creativity, it can push back dementia. Or if you have dementia, it can make it go slower, helps people avoid burnout. There's a number of studies showing that creative people tend to have more friends in real life. They tend to have more romance and physical intimacy. There's a whole idea of legacy, and I've gotten absolutely fascinated by this, um, particularly the older I get, where a lot of folks see creativity as a way of attaining what is called symbolic immortality where we all know we're going to die and no other species know this, knows this. Um, and that's kind of a depressing thought for a Friday afternoon. But the idea is that symbolic immortality means part of you can live on. And there are many ways of attaining this, not just creativity. Kids is a big way. Um, believing in literal immortality in an afterlife through religion or spirituality, reincarnation is another way. Um, there has been a little bit on people who suggest optimal experience, which at first I thought was like, oh, this like flow, and then I read more, and they're really talking more, doing a lot of LSD. But creativity is also another way. Your creative work living on, and not necessarily just big C. Because these two paintings are in my living room. These were by my grandmother, who was certainly not big C, not pro C, and little C, honestly, is probably generous, but they're colorful, they're nice, um, and it makes me think of her. And then finally, and this is, um, there's some exciting work being done on this. If you look at all these traits associated with being creative, and I mean, openness to new experiences and ideas is the big one, but you got a perspective taking, tolerance of ambiguity, um, sensible risk taking. I mean, a lot of the things, it's not just creativity they're associated with, it's also tolerance. And so there have been studies on how they relate to being more multicultural, um, more sensitive to other cultures, less likely to prejudice, uh, be prejudiced or stereotyping. My student, Sarah Luria, is doing uh, finishing up her dissertation with very promising results, looking at being creative and having an equitable mindset. There's a lot of work, a lot of this in Eastern Europe, looking at different interventions and how they can help creativity and they can help tolerance and equity. And I mean, I've largely focused on individual benefits. And me and me and Bob Sternberg kind of have this running debate where he focuses on transformative creativity, creativity that will help the world. I tend to focus much more on individual benefits. 
probably because I'm a selfish bastard and can't really imagine anybody not being a selfish bastard. But it is true that the value of creativity goes beyond that. Um, there's a lot of work by Richard Florida that shows that the places where creative industries industries thrive tend to be more diverse. They tend to have more pro-equity policies in place, particularly um, pro-LGBTQ. And at the bigger picture, I mean, David Cropley's done a, a, a nice amount of work showing how creative engineering has helped some issues in the 70s and 80s and, and perhaps may save us yet and allow us to destroy the planet for even longer. Um, we've all seen how creativity in science has helped, or many of us have seen, how it can help things like COVID. And yeah, short and sweet. And I'm guessing questions will be afterwards. But I would like to turn this now to Gerard. Well, thank you, James. So we will open it up for questions afterwards. Uh, let me share my screen. And so now, as the title suggests, this is the third perspective. So looking at creative process as measured through the foresight uh, self-assessment tool, um, in many ways, this builds on uh, Molly's comment about mindset and the intersection of mindset uh, with, with well-being. So I won't assume that everyone here is familiar with Foresight. Foresight is a 36-item self-report measure that looks at how individuals express their preferences with the kind of cognition, fundamental cognition, we see in the creative process. So foresight measures four preferences, uh, a tendency to want to clarify, a tendency to move towards ideation and abstract global thinking, a tendency to like to focus on an idea, an initial solution and use analysis to refine that solution. And then the fourth scale, the fourth preference, looks at a bent towards action uh, implementation to move from concept to, to reality. So the study that I'm uh, going to share with you uh, was published actually in a journal that uh, James knows rather well. In fact, if memory serves, he was the editor of this journal at the time that it was published in one of my co-authors, Pam Zalay, who's out there and I can see her, maybe Pam can wave. Uh, was instrumental in uh, making this research study happen when she worked for the Mental Health Association of, of Niagara County. So we looked at six scales of well-being. Uh, Amber Boyer was doing her uh, master's degree at the time at Niagara University in uh, clinical psychology and had access to cobble together a measure that looked at anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, perseverance, premeditation, sensation seeking, and urgency. Uh, I'm not going to read the definition of each of these to you, but we selected these six um, aspects of well-being to kind of try to get a range of, uh, to try to touch well-being from a, a range of perspectives. Um, and so we correlated foresight, so this measure of four creative process preferences with these six dimensions of well-being. We had a sample of nearly 200. And I'm, I'm just going to take you through a, a, a number of three specific uh, correlations that show how creative process intersects with these dimensions of well-being. And it reminded me, when I was putting the slides together, of what uh, Zorana said yesterday about creativity being a roller coaster, right? That there are ups and downs and it's complicated. And so I think now, given her keynote yesterday, I kind of see the correlations between foresight, these creative process preferences, helping us to understand the emotional roller coaster of the creative process, right? Those of us who engage in creative work, know there are times when you're exhilarated and there are times when you're frustrated. And there are aspects of the process where you just feel stuck. 
and and stressed and and so I think this begins to illuminate maybe what that roller coaster is. So um, I will pick three specific ways in which these foresight creative process preferences intersect with these six dimensions to highlight different um, curves and high points and low points in this roller coaster. So premeditation um, happened to correlate with, didn't happen, this is what we expected, correlated with clarifying. So clarifying is that um, tendency to want to gather information, really understand the current reality, frame up what the issues are, and premeditation uh, focuses on, and I'll, I'll jump back to the definition, uh, premeditation focuses on the ability to think before acting, right? So reviewing and reviewing a situation. This can become problematic when we start to go over the same ground more, uh, more than once, that we get stuck in our thoughts. And so Premeditation, not surprising when you look at the, the correlation across the four areas of the creative process, its strongest relationship was with clarifying. So that might illuminate a particular twist or turn within the creative process for people who have a clarifying preference that they may get stuck or an advantage looking at it slightly differently is that moment to pause emotionally before moving forward to reflect. Uh, next one I want to highlight is sensation seeking with ideating. So uh, sensation seeking is that buzz that you get from novelty, being open to experience, uh, being open to experimenting, and the strongest correlation that sensation seeking had with the creative process. And I think this is sort of uh, intuitively um, uh, apparent to us is with the ideating, the the more global thinking, the more abstract thinking, the more imaginative oriented person. And I will share one more implementing so that action oriented, let's stop talking about ideas, let's do something with our ideas, uh, correlated with anxiety. But interestingly, it was a negative correlation indicating that those who have a high preference for implementing also reported a, uh, they were less inclined to experience anxiety, uh, which again, intuitively it makes sense or theoretically it makes sense that those who have a bent to leap to action may not be held back by anxious thoughts that, that they're, they, who me, me worry? What do you mean me worry? I'll figure it out as I, as I go along. So Reflecting on Zorana's uh, presentation yesterday, I think perhaps what this begins to do is to illuminate the emotional roller coaster we might experience as we engage in the creative process. So, four, I would put forth to you uh, four possible implications from this research. One, it expands our understanding of the emotional roller coaster relative to the creative process. So, when you go through the creative process, you're going to experience different emotions. Right when you're clarifying, it's going to feel different than when one ideates. And of course, given our kind of style preferences, we may stop at certain points on the roller coaster. Right, in terms of our our preferences. So, those with high clarifying may get stuck clarifying because of their tendency towards premeditation, or implementers who me worry might move very quickly into implementation because of um, the fact that they don't experience those emotions associated with uh, anxiety. Moving on, understanding the relationships between these creative process preferences and emotions may improve self-awareness and self-leadership. So we heard from Zorana yesterday, and of course, one of the things that we talk about in terms of change leadership is that it all starts with self-awareness. So by looking at your foresight profile, it might give you some indications in terms of the emotions that you might experience relative to the creative process. And that leads, we hope, into more effective self-leadership, self-management, metacognition, and mindfulness. Um, 
third, maybe, maybe this might promote an acceptance of the positive side of some mental health diagnoses. And I'll, I'll give a very real example here. Uh, one of my uh, sons, and there was actually a research paper published in 2011 on this, looking at the relationship between foresight and ADD, ADHD. And the intersection between ADD and ADHD uh, showed that high uh, preference for high ideating was correlated with ADD and ADHD, which, which we often look at as a pejorative or a negative label. And I remember my, my son, high ideator, before he went off to university, was diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, and prescribed medication. And so we talked about it. And I said, you know, it's great to have another tool to help you to focus. Um, but, you know, there's also some beautiful things that come along with your ideating preference. The fact that you have tried and experimented with lots of things in your life. The fact that you're really drawn to uh, many fields, uh, including music. And he was self-taught on the drums, played the violin, recently has mastered the bass guitar. Um, and so, you know, perhaps this starts to shift rather than taking a negative label on and owning it, we can replace that or look at the more positive side of, of these diagnoses. So instead of ADD, ADHD, we can blend that with, hey, you're a beautiful ideator. Embrace it. Isn't that a, isn't that a lovely thing? And then finally, uh, maybe insights from this study could help us to shift our language from negative self-talk uh, and judgment to more of a process glitch or a temporary moment. Again, a story from my own experiences. Um, uh, I was in England and my boys were going to be joining me on a, on a summer vacation there. And I got a phone call from my son, Anthony. And I'm like, why am I getting a phone call from him? He's supposed to be on the flight coming over to England. Why is he calling me? And he started, the first thing he said in the conversation was, dad, low clarifier moment. Okay, what do you mean low clarifier moment? My passport expired. I didn't know that until I got to the airport. I now have to get a new passport. I'm gonna be delayed 24 hours. So rather than negative self-talk, like, oh, I'm a terrible person, it was a moment. It was a, hey, low clarifying moment. Um, this is a part of the process. We'll work through this. I'm gonna solve it. And in 24 hours, uh, 24 hours later, he had joined us in in uh, in Manchester. So it just some possible implications looking at the intersection of of creative process with with uh, emotions. And as Molly so elegantly said, I think there are some interesting implications when we think about mindset and and well-being. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing, and we have five minutes for some Q and A. Um, and I'm, I'm going to recommend because many many of you have access to me. Not that I'm dodging any questions, but because we have James here and and Molly, that um, uh, let's flip on our our microphones or raise your digital hand. That might be the best way to do it. And nor. You win, you're first. Nor, why don't you go ahead and flip your microphone on and then go ahead and pose your question. Thank you, Gerard, great presentation uh, and great insight sharing uh, the story of your son again. Um, a quick question uh, from your study. Um, I just saw um, an association, a significant association between sensation seeking and developing as well. Um, what my perception was that Developers uh, don't usually like sensation seeking, do they? Uh, it's, it's more of an ideator or an implementer job to be sensation seeking. Um, so any, any insights on that? Yeah, that's a great observation, uh, really remarkable observation. And in fact, that helped to expand the foresight theory because clarifying did not correlate with sensation seeking. And so what we took away from that was um, developers do have a tendency to look for ideas that have promise. And so where clarifying that kind of thinking is about mitigating risk and trying to understand reality, 
developing, which is further along, if you think about the process, creative process in a linear way, it's about taking a creative idea and thinking about how to polish it in such a way that it will be successful. So there's an optimism. And Nora, that's that's how I see that, that connection. So, so thanks, thanks for picking up on that. Uh, others, go ahead and let's go raise our digital hand. Noor, did you raise your hand again? You have another question? Uh, no, I showed a thumbs up. Oh, a thumbs up. Oh, well, thank you. Okay. And Dr. Firesing just gave me two thumbs up. Questions for our presenters. Well, I'll ask a question if nobody else has one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I put it in the chat. It really wasn't a question, but more of a future consideration. I'm wondering um, if you had ever considered using the EQI, the Emotional Social uh, Intelligence um, uh, measure in your research, um, because it has a built-in happiness indicator in there. Um, and it, and it, and it the, the emotional social competencies in there are would I think would be advantageous in the research and the work that you're doing. I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. Are you posing that question to anyone in particular? Well, um, for Molly, perhaps with the research that, that mm -hmm. her and James did, mm -hmm. it went it went by so fast. I so I tried to remember. <laughs> but yeah. I, yeah, I got to, oh, 15 minutes goes by really, really quickly. Um, and we we did not give any um emotional intelligence measures, um, we did give measures of um, positive affect and negative affect, but um, um, no emotional intelligence measures. So that could be something interesting to, to look into. Yeah. Well, it um, was, um, it was uh, built or founded on positive mental wellness, um, all, you know, years back by Dr. Baran. Um, and a lot of, I don't see it being used at all, really. Um, in the healing professions or in the mental health industry. Um, so, I'll, I mean, I'll be using it in my dissertation, but it's, it's really a wonderful um, uh, measure to use when you're talking about a person's wellness, especially mental wellness. Mm, thank you. Yeah, yeah, good suggestion. That, that's the beautiful thing about the Creativity Expert Exchange is sharing this with experts in creativity. We often get new ideas and insights. So Kathy Sue, thank you very much for sharing that. James, I want to circle back because uh, I want to give you a little bit of airtime as we wrap up. You made reference to a book that you're working on, or maybe it's forthcoming. Um, Molly has briefly mentioned the book to me that you're working on, but can you say more about that book and the content and focus of that? Absolutely. It's um, coming out from Cambridge in July. I just finished the copy edited chapters and the proofs will either before I know it. It's one of the, that, and then another book on uh, creativity lessons from musical theater legends, which is written with what uh, a composer, actually one of my favorite musicals, The Fix, uh, is also coming out this year. So um, wow. those have been two long abating projects that have been tremendous fun uh, and hopefully will be of some interest. Yeah, well, congratulations. So I, I don't want to stop any questions uh, if anybody has a burning question. Otherwise, we will move to breakout groups and we'll have small group discussion looking at our key takeaways from our 2023 Creativity Expert Exchange Conference. But uh, because we have Molly and James here, I will pause for a moment to see if there are any further questions. Actually, okay. Dan? Sure, thanks. I couldn't find my smiley face or my hand or whatever. <laughs> so this question is for James. Um, what struck me the most um, in your presentation was something I'd never heard before about when you're talking about the value of creativity and that um, symbolic immortality. Like that just leapt out at me, you know, because we're all afraid of oblivion, you know, <laughs> and it is, I would just like to maybe hear more about that or if you could share where we should go to learn more about that. So the, the idea is from uh, Robert J. Lifton, who's done a couple of really good books that 
aren't psychology, they're more sociology, philosophy, mm -hmm. um, but, and, and they're, they're quite brilliant. And it was really popular in the 60s and 70s, and then people stopped citing it a whole lot. But mm. it's, it resurfaced a little bit in some of terror management theory. But honestly, I didn't think, I didn't love the way they treated it, which is why I decided to kind of revisit it. And we've been, mm. um, me and a few others are actually now working on, can we develop a legacy scale looking at creativity? And wow. so we're at the early stages to see what might help the benefits, um, any particular, like the matter of you want your name to be remembered or just your works um, and, and, and stuff like that. And, um, and it, it's, oh, I mean, it's some of it's also related. I mean, Ron Baghetto and I are back to work at some 4C concepts. And so we're also kind of mulling over some of these ideas in, in the paper we're working on. So, um, but Robert J. Lifton is and an originally auto rank from the 30s although he only had wow. three wow. Um, it was a, a blast from the past you know yeah, thanks so much when your auto rank referred to wow talk about legacy so uh, I, I, I add to that please to rod sorry it's marlies, marlies? Yeah, that. yeah marlies you have a question yeah no just just the um, the notion. So to build on on this discussion about the legacy is at the um, appreciative inquiry conference. There was an invitation or an invitational speech, really, about having the conversations that we need to have mm. people that we care care about, and that was also a way of leaving a legacy was to have meaningful conversations. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I, I like that's a nice that. thought. I like that. Does that mean you're gonna, reach, you're gonna reach out to me soon to tell me you want to have a meaningful conversation with me? Yes, please, Gerard. <laughs> okay, I'll look forward to it. <laughs> I hope you're well and great to see you. So I want to thank uh, James and Molly. I'm gonna invite folks to drop into the chat box any affirmative comments you want to to make to the two. Uh, we're going to end the conference here in our uh, concurrent session. I've uh, randomized. Um, uh, assign folks randomly to to groups and we've had some people drop out since I made those assignments so the groups vary from two to seven although I see one of the groups that has two has Ryan Hill in it and Ryan is never shy about sharing his insights um I set the small groups for a seven minute conversation what I'd like you to talk about is uh what's your big takeaway from this creativity expert exchange? Did you have a, an aha? Did you uh, have a new realization? Molly and James, just because I did this randomly, you were assigned to a small group, but feel free to, to drop out or do as you wish. Uh, when the seven minutes is over, we'll all come back and uh, I'll entertain, open up the floor if folks would like to share for the go to the public order, any any key insights that they had. So what are your big takeaways, reflections? We're doing this as a cooperative learning exercise so that we can potentially influence one another and nourish one another as we discuss our, our big takeaways. So I will send you all to groups and then we'll come back in seven minutes. James, thank you very much. Thank you, thank Molly. You, thank you. Hi, G. Hi, Raj. I just thought I'd hang around here. <laughs> oh, you are welcome to hang out with me. And it looks like uh, Michelle. Hey there. And hey, Pablo, Pablo. what time is it? <laughs> I so, Pablo, I'm Pablo, waiting for your invite for another, another workshop. Roger. What's that, Pablo? Been waiting for another invite of your workshops. Yeah, we had we had one, and so you're on the list, baby. You did a great job last time, man. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, 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 Doctor P. Uh, 
when is a good time for me to call you next week? Uh, actually, you know, I'm 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm traveling next week. Um, the week after, I can tell you that March, uh, March 21. And actually, after 11 o'clock on March 20. So after 11 o'clock on the 20th and March 20 after after 11 o'clock. Oh, OK, sure. I will. Thank you. So much. I, am, I was alone in my room, so I well, you, can, you can talk to us. OK, what's your okay. big takeaway? Uh, I would say that yesterday too, I participated to the, um, with, you know, with Melissa and there were three talking about intuition and everything. And I was trying to link it with today a bit, you know, with, um, so I'm not sure yet of all the connections because mm -hmm. we had to study like three for Susan class. So we had to make like an overview of uh, three conferences and try to link some scholars so now with the theories of the, the, the seas, mm -hmm. I was linking today, but I was trying to make deeper connection throughout everybody workshops mm -hmm. and different mm -hmm. perspectives. So that's why I was like all the intuition. And then today with you, the three of you talking about, you know, like the small everyday uh, creativity mm -hmm. and with the study of Molly that I think there's for sure everything is like intertwined. Yeah. But uh, I would like, I would be curious to, deepen this yeah yeah I, the the, the well-being area is really fascinating to me because i have uh, and molly talks about this um research is often very personal mm -hmm. and, and the study of creativity is very personal to me because i know how profound it has been in my life and how um uh, health giving health reinforcing it has been for me and I see it you know our graduate students talk about how transformative the experience is and I I can't help but think the more we venture into you know traditionally training programs and creativity have looked at abilities you know what abilities did you walk away with mm -hmm. um and not so much so, I mean, there may be, I, I don't have every study memorized, but thinking about the, the metacognitive study that was done of 70 research uh, investigations into the impact of creativity training, I don't think well-being was even mentioned. Um, but it's so, right, so as I grow older, I see how mental health impacts so many people. I mean, it impacts all of us. At yeah. some level, because we're in this relationship with ourselves. And so if creativity, deliberate creativity can help us to, um, you know, it kind of goes back to some of the humanistic psychologists like Rogers and Maslow, help us to self-actualize, then it's a great, great gift to study creativity and to, to nurture it. So... I, I, I'm very excited about this whole line of, of thinking. But it goes, it's it's a it's with the trend too. When you look at the rise of yoga and the, we are in a generation that people want to take care, of eating more healthy, be more mm -hmm. conscious. You know, it's about consciousness, and mm -hmm. you can link that to creativity because the studies mm -hmm. they were. But if you go back now with the for sure with the class of Susan, I'm really like the foundations so of all the scholars. But even though through all this, I was studying Taylor, for example. And then I realized last Friday night, I was like, I, my son too is AD, um, ADHD. So I can, like, I felt your story because he's mm. always losing something, always forgetting something. And I'm organized, so it's hard. And he's mm. 12 years old, he's working hard on it, but it's not easy. So I understand. And, and I was telling Susan, I'm like, even though he made these studies, you know, about multiple talents, we're still, we go to school, they're still teaching the same way about the only dimensions of academic, but he's yeah. no good academically. Poor kid, he's trying hard. He's like rushing his life and it's creating anxiety, but he had other, other talents, other skills he can develop, but still 
you know that the U.S. and Canada were similar in the in the, the systems, and everything is still academic, and this drives me crazy. Well, and this is you know what I try to talk to my son about is don't give in to the pejorative label, but recognize the beautiful side because there's research that mm -hmm. talks about creativity and ADD, ADHD. But it's mo mostly from uh, an ideational perspective, like you're really good at divergent thinking. And that's mm -hmm. great and should celebrate that. And, you know, my son has uh, played lacrosse, has played soccer, again, musical instruments, does drawing, you know, and, and it was like he like experimented with all of that before he was even in high school, you know, and it could be looked at as a can't you get focused? Is, is he the one who played golf with? Uh, no, that's my that's my other son. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this one he 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 he's tried, but he can't stand it. <laughs> he can't focus. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not oh, his. It's, it's not his sport. It's not no. his sport. So, but yeah, I think there's great promise, Melissa, in the implications of this are deeply meaningful. So, so as folks come back, we will officially wrap the conference. And this looks like it's, um, we have experienced some attrition. So we're, we're a pretty small group now. Uh, I will just ask um, folks, let's take a few examples. What are your big ahas or insights, takeaways, or something that just has you really deeply reflecting um, based on your experience here at our 2023 Creativity Expert Exchange? And uh, you can wave your hands if you can't find your digital hand, or you can raise your digital hand. We'll take uh, three or four examples. Marlies, I saw you waving, and then we'll go to Donna Lynn. Marlies, yeah, go, yeah, go yeah, ahead, Marlies. Thanks, Gerard. I, I, I think for me, the, the biggest uh, reawakening is just how impactful creativity is on the quality of our lives and well-being and, and taking us forward in, in such a generative way. So just... Uh, that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to see more research along those lines. And certainly, um, you know, Roger, you and I have experienced you for a lot longer than me. Let me just emphasize <laughs> that. The transformative oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. power of, of this kind of education. So yeah. yeah. Donna Lynn, I see your profile photo and I see your hand up. And I know, we'll I'm so sorry. I am I caught all of this from the car because I was taking my kiddo oh, to the airport. No worries. Um, just want so, to make but sure. I'm pulled over right now so that I okay, can raise safe. my hand and talk. Yes. Um, so I actually had the joy of just talking with um, Pam and Karina. And one of the kind of threads in ours that I really liked was just kind of getting back into the community and mm -hmm. just kind of seeing what people are doing. Um, and for me, we get really like into our silos. And so coming to see you is really kind of a way to just say all of the different paths that creativity is being explored in everyone's different worlds and genres and everything is just really inspiring. So wow. I really enjoyed it. Well, well, thanks. I think we're going to keep doing these. Huh, when, I think when you so. get testimonials <laughs> like that, that's why we do it. So thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna Lynn. Uh, Suzanne, you look like you're frozen. No, you were just sitting absolutely still. Okay, Suzanne. <laughs> okay. Um, we Well, first of all, I really like the emphasis on feeling and emotion and effective state, starting with the first speaker. And there was just a thread throughout, and it was really um, a great, so, many, so much great information. We were talking about the um, speaker's um, well, talking about the difference in diversity when between dem, uh, the new definition, we, that democratic diversity provided no contribution, whereas cognitive diversity made such a difference. Mm. And it's been a couple of years now in the Foresight community that the, there is a recognition that we have a different approach to diversity and inclusivity. But yeah. to hear it put in assessment terms and to hear it put so starkly and to hear it put in black and white, like, mm. no, yes, it was shocking. Mm. I mean, it was mm. really shocking. I had thought it was just a nice alternative, you yeah. know, but to 
but to hear that demographic diversity plays very little part in um, in reaching the outcome you want. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was really shot. I really made me sit back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. Well, thanks, thanks, Suzanne. Noor, are you out there? I see your digital hand up, and I, I promise to allow three uh, folks to share their insights. So if you're there, Noor, I'm going to have you flip your microphone on and go ahead and share with us. Um, yes, uh, thanks, Gerard. Um, uh, I think I think a couple of things should out for me. Um, one is that um, 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 through, through this uh, conference, now I really believe that creativity is a cutting edge specialty, especially uh, knowing Roger's work and uh, our work with Dr. Nagma that correlates the foresight profile with the technical profile of emergency positions. Um, and uh, me, being a, me, me being an emergency position now, actually connecting the dots and uh, believing more and more that creativity is not a, now a cutting edge. Uh, uh, specialty with the uh, possibility of uh, integrating it into the medical curriculum and beyond. So that's uh, that's uh, that's that's what going to be exciting for the next couple of years. And otherwise, the introduction of the DPS that uh, you mentioned yesterday. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. That how it will spill out from the PhD, which uh, is which is more research based, more theoretical, and really exciting to know how DPS goes. Uh, be more practical uh, in the real world. Well, well, thanks, Noor. Thank you so much. So yeah, if folks are, Noor is just making reference to the DPS Doctorate of Professional Studies in Creativity and Change Leadership, which our department will be launching in fall of 2024. If anybody's interested in that or learning more about that, I uh, invite you to, to reach out to me. So a term we use often to describe the work that we do in the field of creativity is transformational. And I do firmly believe that when we study creativity and we focus on our creativity and we tap into our creativity, we are in the business of transforming ourselves and others. And that can't help, I believe, but, but to be life-giving. Um, what a great gift to have this community, just wonderful to see you all. Donna Lynn expressed very well the power of plugging into this community. So I feel very fortunate that we're, we're not single lone individuals, but we're all uh, pulling in a similar direction. And I think there's a, there's power, there's power in community. So um, save the date. March 7 and 8, 2024. This is the first time ever we've announced our conference a year in advance. That's what happens when you have a, an event planner like Kristen Peterson working with you. She bends you down and says, okay, before this conference is over, I know you guys always wait to like three months before the next C to announce it. So we're committed to March 7 and 8, 2024. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Hey, Gerard, stay on for just a second. What do you want to catch up with you? Okay. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Yeah, Molly, you can stay too. <laughs> Pablo, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I thought that was good. That conference was just fantastic. Yeah, yeah so pleased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really terrific. So, yeah. Roger, 